We are live. Okay. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. We're going to give it another minute or two as uh, people log in. Thank you. We'll give it another 30 seconds or so before we start as uh, people log in. Okay, um, hello everybody. Welcome to this webinar of the Nazio Nehruk Grid Interactive Efficient Buildings Working Group on considerations and approaches for grid interactive efficient buildings and their pilots. Uh, I will be joined by Danielle Sass Burnett of Nehruk, who will also offer a uh, greetings in, in a few moments. And we're very fortunate to have uh, two state representatives, Liz Reichardt from Washington's Department of Commerce, which is State Energy Office, and Grace Relf of uh, the Hawaii Public Utilities Commission. And they will be co-moderating as well as offering some remarks from their states on uh, technical assistance being provided by Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, uh, Christine Holland and Juliet Homer, who you will hear from for most of uh, today's session. I do want to, uh, next slide, Ed, please, and, and acknowledging my uh, colleague, Ed Carley, as well. Um, a little bit of logistics. Uh, everyone is muted. Uh, I think we will have the opportunity to unmute uh, people later on uh, during the Q&A. However, uh, please use the uh, Q&A uh, box for questions uh, during that session. The recording and the slides will be posted. Next slide, please. Uh, just a little reminder about the working group. This is a joint uh, uh, initiative of us and NARUK, NASIO and NARUK. Uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, support of the Building Technologies Office of the United States Department of Energy. And we are very uh, pleased to have the collaboration with several of the national laboratories in this area of which you will hear from one. Next slide. I did want to highlight a few, a couple of coming events. Uh, this Thursday, uh, there will be a NARUC webinar on virtual power plants, which ought to be really interesting and uh, really pertinent to this audience. Uh, and on August 31st, there will be a webinar uh, sponsored by the Department of Energy. Actually, it's an encore presentation of the Colorado Residential Retrofit Energy District, and that'll be on August 31st. Uh, we also are highlighting a few recent resources that are on the uh, GEB Working Group uh, resources page and reiterating the national roadmap that was published uh, a couple of months ago. Also, a GSA document on integrating grid interactive building technologies in performance contracting. So I've babbled on enough, so uh, I will uh, pass the virtual baton to Danielle to offer some uh, welcome from uh, Nehruk's perspective, and then we'll get on with the show. Thank you. Thank you, Rodney and Ed, for organizing this event, uh, along with Juliet. I just wanted to welcome everyone on the neighbor side, uh, say a special thanks to Grace and the Hawaii Public Utilities Commission for leading the way yet again in uh, innovating on uh, GEB and other related opportunities and pilots and say how valuable this topic is for the New York membership. Uh, as we know, utilities uh, end up coming in with pilots very frequently, pilot requests very frequently, and what 
the things that we can do to learn from those that are happening elsewhere in the country accelerates the opportunity to learn overall for all of us. So uh, with much appreciation to DOE and PNNL for sponsoring this technical assistance, um, I look forward to hearing what you all have to say. Thanks for being here today. Thank you, Danielle. Well, um, I think it's my turn, but someone stop me if it's not. Um, my name is Grace Ralph, and I work at the Hawaii Public Utilities Commission as a utility analyst. I have been at the commission now about a year and a half, and prior to that time, I was at the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, where my work focused largely on utility sector energy efficiency, and um, I got to do some research on integrated energy efficiency and demand response programs which sort of was my intro into GEBS and Grid Interactive Efficient Buildings. So that's a little bit about me. Um, I am going to provide just a little bit of context on what the, what the landscape for GEBS looks like in Hawaii. So I'm gonna just cover very briefly, you know, what the needs are in Hawaii, our policy and regulatory drivers, as well as our system needs. And then I'm just gonna speak a little bit to um, the ongoing work that we have uh, here in Hawaii to, to hopefully implement some GEBS in the near future. So um, you all are familiar with Hawaii as a, as a beautiful island uh, state, and we have long recognized the need to combat climate change. Um, recently, Hawaii officially declared a climate emergency. So climate change and the need to address climate change um, is a big driver for you know, for deploying renewable resources and GEBS here in Hawaii. I think with the IPCC report coming out yesterday, you know, that's, um, it's being driven home even more so the point that we, we really need to tackle this climate change issue. As an island state, our, our attention on resilience is particularly critical. You know, we can't import electricity from anywhere else. Um, we also have a very high reliance on high cost and volatile imported fossil fuels. Um, we are mainly reliant on oil for our electricity production. So we really are aiming to reduce our reliance on that and um, aiming to be more self-sufficient in terms of our electricity production. Finally, there's a, a really strong need here to address energy affordability and equity. We have the highest residential energy costs in the country. And with the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, the inequalities in um, energy burden, how much households are paying for their energy and how much low income households in particular are paying for their energy has really been exacerbated. And so we are trying really um, aggressively to bring those costs down for consumers while, while making the energy transition equitable for all and accessible for all. Some of the policy drivers that are um, affecting our GEBS, uh, our, our attempts to implement GEBS here in Hawaii include a 100% renewable portfolio standard by 2045. We also have an energy efficiency portfolio standard and a statewide carbon neutrality goal, which includes ground transportation um, also by 2020, 2045. Um, we also have a number of regulatory drivers for the regulated utilities here. So, in June, we just uh, got started on a new performance-based regulation framework for the Hawaiian electric companies. And broadly, this effort aims to align the utilities' profit motives with our desired policy outcomes. Um, and we went through a long stakeholder process to really hone in on what those are and then how the framework was set up to achieve those. And our broad overarching goals are clean energy, cost control, and improving customer experience and customer service. So within that framework, now we have um, financial incentive tied specifically to outcomes that can either enable or directly influence the adoption of GEBS. So we have incentives for advanced metering deployment, um, energy efficiency deployment for low and moderate income communities and acquisition of grid services from DERs. So there are a number of other incentives as well, but to me, those are ones that are specifically um, helpful for the GEB landscape. One other really interesting part of the PBR framework is that it um, included a, an innovative pilot process for the Hawaiian electric companies. So um, HECO can work with stakeholders to propose and implement 
innovative pilots on a more expedited timeline um, than would typically be possible under a regulatory framework. Um, so then finally, I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the system needs that are potential drivers for GEBS in Hawaii. First of all, we know that flexibility and demand flexibility, um, as well as generational flexibility, becomes really important as renewable deployment increases uh, to meet the variable um, the variable needs of the system. And so um, Hawaii has long had um, pretty high deployment of especially customer sited solar systems. And, um, and so that is a driver for GEBS here as well. A near term driver as well is that our largest coal plant, our only coal plant in the, in the state is being retired next year. And so this is a really big driver of um, capacity and grid services needs. And we're, we're aiming to meet those with a number of services, but, um, but largely by distributed energy resources as well. So that's just a little bit of landscape on why we are pursuing GEBS here in Hawaii. Um, our ongoing work here includes um, a state-specific grid interactive efficient building working group. And we are aiming to identify a GEB pilot that we can all kind of sink our teeth into and really get going on implementation for that. And that really, that, that working group has been pretty great. It includes representatives from across the state, including some other folks at the PUC, the Hawaii State Energy Office, um, the utility, our energy efficiency administrator. I'm sure I'm forgetting a number of other folks, but um, it's been a really great collaborative space to bring up ideas and sort of um, share resources and that kind of thing. Um, that group specifically is working with PNNL on technical assistance for our GEB pilot. So we are just in the process of um, reviewing a, a really great work, uh, white paper that they've helped us, um, which will help us implement a GEB pilot as we're able to identify one. And then I just thought it might be helpful to identify some of the really challenging questions that we're still working through here. Um, a big one that's on our minds is how to create a value proposition, both for customers, so folks that are maybe owners of GEBS or you know tenants of buildings, but with but with um, value that actually aligns with what they are providing to the grid and to the system. So we really are thinking through what should the rate design look like, what how should we be compensating DERs, energy efficiency, that kind of thing. Um, and then I guess one big thing is we're, we're really trying to identify a specific pilot, getting past that discussion and into implementation. And then hopefully we'll be um, thinking about how to scale once we get that pilot off the ground. So that's what I've um, got for landscape in Hawaii. And I would love to pass it over to Liz from Washington to provide some insights from, from your state. Great, thank you so much, Grace. It's always great to hear uh, what Hawaii is up to. So uh, my name is Liz Reichart. I am a senior policy specialist at the State of Washington Energy Office, which is housed in our Department of Commerce. Uh, and I focus on energy efficiency in the built environment. Uh, before this role, I was working for NYSERDA and then before that, World Resources Institute, both in buildings and clean energy policy focused roles. So all this is to say, I'm so excited to be with Geb Nazio Nehruk group this afternoon to give a quick intro into what the Geb landscape looks like in Washington. So we in Washington have some foundational factors that are going to drive the expansion of grid interactive buildings. Washington has aggressive emissions mandates and clean energy standards as set by our Clean Energy Transformation Act or CETA as we call it. This means that we are working towards 100% clean energy by 2045. Uh, we also need to desperately address energy affordability and equity and CETA includes a sweeping equity mandate and funds uh, to do work around energy reliability. So these are going to drive uh, a lot of our GEB activity. On top of this, we also have a clean building standard for commercial buildings greater than 50,000 square feet. And in addition to that, we have the 2021 state energy strategy that will serve as our roadmap to guide all of these pieces. Um, in addition, there is a lot of opportunity for GEB in Washington uh, to benefit from some 
regulatory drivers, such as multi-year rate planning and new regulatory tools. Uh, in addition, uh, our system needs are really what we foresee as driving the development of GAB and GAB pilots. Uh, Washington's regional planning um, and our state energy strategy are indicating to us that there that new flexible capacity is needed as we move towards 100% clean energy. And there's clearly an increased need to address shortfalls um, as climate change increasingly impacts summer generation from hydro um, and statewide loads continue to increase. So all of these factors are driving the development of GEB projects in Washington. And the good news is that we already have some ongoing work or some uh, work in the pipeline on GEBs in Washington. So our Clean Energy Fund was appropriated a $10 million bucket of funds for building electrification projects that advance the goals of our state energy strategy to demonstrate grid-enabled, high-efficiency, all-electric buildings. Uh, we also already have some very innovative transactive grid work going on in Eastern Washington, uh, one particular pilot going on uh, at Washington State University in Spokane, uh, a kind of a campus pilot approach, um, doing some very innovative work. Um, so in part to inform how GEB funds should be spent and to get more pilots off the ground, we've been working closely with PNNL on technical assistance for GEB pilots. Uh, our hope is that this will be a really helpful pathway, not only for policymakers, but Washington utilities and a range of other energy stakeholders who are thinking about GEB pilots, but not sure where to begin or how to measure success. And so I just want to thank PNNL and DOE for this work. This technical assistance is going to be critical as Washington continues to work through some of those challenging GEB questions, uh, including how exactly to support all S aspects of the GEB project pipeline from uh, stakeholdering and education, uh, pre-design work um, to multifaceted holistic projects. So with that little bit of context around Washington, I'm going to introduce our speakers for today. So Christine Holland has been with Pacific Northwest National Laboratory for just over a year. She comes from a variety of energy backgrounds, including marketing, integrated resource planning, energy efficiency, and market transformation. She formerly worked at the Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance, NIA, and Pacific Corps. She now works primarily as an economic, as in economics in the energy policy and economics group at PNNL. Juliet Homer is a professional engineer and the energy policy analytics team lead at PNNL. She formerly worked as a staff member at the Oregon Public Utility Commission, and before that as consulting water engineer in Phoenix. At PNNL, she works on policy issues associated with grid planning, with distributed energy resources, integrating re integrated resource planning, and energy water nexus issues. And with that, Christine, Juliet, I will let you take it away. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Liz. I'm gonna try and share my screen here. Let's see. Okay, can everybody see that? Yes. Okay, excellent. So hi everyone, I'm really happy to be here. I'm Juliet Homer from Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. And as Liz said, I'll be presenting with Christine Holland today. And we're gonna kind of go back and forth throughout the presentation. Um, let's see. So I'm gonna to touch on um, the project origin I'm gonna talk about the purpose of these technical briefs. So we're providing technical briefs to uh, Washington and Hawaii uh, to support them with pilots. Um, I'll talk about the current status of our work there. And then we'll touch on kind of the general approach that we're taking as we provide this technical assistance and um, develop these briefs. Um, then we'll talk about some important considerations for pilots um, and talk about the difference between kind of our approach with Washington and our approach with Hawaii. Uh, and then we'll move on to next steps. So a little bit about the project. So this project is part of the US Department of Energy's Grid Modernization Lab Consortium. So a group of labs working together on important issues for the grid. And this project itself is on providing technical assistance on grid interactive efficient buildings. And as has been mentioned, we're working together uh, with Lawrence Berkeley National Labs and uh, National Renewable Energy Laboratory 
And the piece of this project that PNL is focused on is on GAB pilots. So um, we're pleased to be uh, have been working through this NASIO and Nehru um, GAB working group that I imagine most of you are a part of. So that's really been kind of the vehicle for providing this technical assistance. Um, and as I said, we're working with Washington and Hawaii on, on some issues of pilots. We've also had some preliminary conversations with Minnesota and Michigan. And depending on how things go with budget and timing, we you know, may continue to work with them and support them uh, with technical briefs as well. So overall, the goal of what we're doing is to assist utilities, uh, states, and regulatory commissions with the creation of GEB pilots. And the way we're doing that is through these uh, technical briefs tailored specifically uh, to each state and their needs. Okay, so basically GEBs are potentially very beneficial, but they're new and they're complex. So the purpose of our work uh, in these technical briefs is really to help to create clarity and a common language when it comes to grid interactive efficient buildings and the services that they can provide. You know, as we had initial conversations as part of this project, that's one thing we heard is people don't know what to, um, how to communicate GEBS, what they are, what they can do. So that's part of what we're doing with these technical briefs is providing that context. Uh, we are looking to clarify challenger, challenges and barriers to GEB um, and then illuminate how GEBS can tie to specific state policy goals um, and highlight the specific policies that might be um, supported or leveraged through GEB pilots. And then and um, also just establishing some important considerations for successful pilots. In terms of our current status, um, we're working in Washington with staff of the Washington Utilities and Transportation Commission and the um, Department of Commerce. And we had a few iterations with them on this technical brief um, and we're working on finalizing that now. In Hawaii, we've been participating in this really excellent um, GEB working group for Hawaii. So we've been participating in that over the last months and we've also developed a technical brief uh, draft that's circulating now in Hawaii. So that's the current status of the project. So in terms of the general approach that we're taking with the technical briefs, um, we we're starting out with just establishing the basics of grid interactive efficient buildings um, and then trying to define, the, define those grid usable benefits um, from GEBS. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, identifying those state or utility specific objectives that could be supported through GEBS. Um, and then we get into the important you know, potential goals for pilots and what are some metrics that could be used to uh, measure achieving those goals? What are the types of data that are needed and other considerations for success of pilots? And we'll, you know, once we finalize these briefs, we're going to make these available to the working group and they'll be available through uh, the NASIO websites and you'll have access to those. And I just want to point to these important resources and um, Rodney already has done that, but you know, as we develop these briefs, we don't want to reinvent the wheel and there's a lot of really great information that's already been developed through these DOE efforts. Um, this roadmap just came out in May, many of you are probably familiar with it, but if you're interested in GEV, it's a great resource. So we've drawn a lot from these materials as we're developing these briefs uh, specific to the state. So we've got the roadmap and then this other um, report that was done, uh, report series by DOE. So I just want to make sure folks are aware of these. All right, and Christine, why don't you take it away? Great. Thank you so much, Juliet. Can, can everyone hear me? Sounds good. Wonderful. Let me get my video going here. Hello, everyone. Um, so to continue with what Juliet was saying, um, our first section speaks to GEB basics. And with this section, we want to ground everyone in exactly what a GEB is. Uh, again, we are using language from the Department of Energy. And that's like GEBs are an energy efficient building that uses smart technologies and on-site distributed energy resources that can provide both demand and supply side resource mix. These could include demand response and demand flexibility, uh, as well as energy efficient appliance and technologies, solar photovoltaics, uh, electric vehicles with smart charging capability, or potentially or eventually vehicle to grid capability, and also battery storage systems. Uh, and in addition to these 
different technologies and capabilities, you also need GED systems and softwares so that you can simultaneously manage all of these technologies and understand the output and optimize building performance and costs. You also need systems and technologies for the building to respond to grid signals. Lastly, system technologies need to optimize several buildings so that it can be used as a grid resource. And that's what we highlight in the bottom box. And one of the reasons that GEBS are so powerful is that we can aggregate flexible load and supply across several buildings. So it can be used more effectively as a grid resource. Okay, and I'm gonna to talk to this slide. This is directly from the GEB roadmap, but I think it really helps to kind of illuminate the different aspects and the kind of enabling technologies that are required for GEB. I just want to point to quickly here that you know the green uh, circles around the outside of the box are are you know the building services at the bottom. What are the actual services that you get from your building? The thermal comfort, the hot water, the refrigeration, the, the air quality, and then you've got your distributed energy resources that a building might have, such as solar PV, electric vehicles, and storage. And then if you go to the top of the green circle at the top, this is the actual buildings to grid interface. So this is where the building is actually responding and, and interacting with the grid, responding to price signals or grid needs. But in order to achieve that, the, you know, the items and the, the technology layers, as they're called here, uh, within the box are required. And I think it's interesting to think about those. So at the bottom here, we have this physical systems within the technology layer. So these are the actual appliances in the building that are going to provide these services, the hardware, the appliances, or the building structure itself. And then on top of that, you need the sensing and the actuation. So these are kind of occupancy sensors or temperature sensors that can kind of, they're smart, they can understand what's going on with the building, the physical systems. So on top of that, you have the local control. So these are the control of the individual optim, um, building um, components. So they take, they're taking the information from the sensing and the actuation, and they're controlling those individual components. And, but in GEVs, you have, even on top of that, you need the supervisory control. And so this is the control that can look across elements within a building, or eventually even across buildings within a campus, to then go ahead and provide that buildings to grid interface. So when we talk about GEVs, it's more than just the hot water, the water heater or the lighting, you need these technology layers in order to really provide that, that interaction with the grid. And what's true is a lot of customers won't have this kind of control infrastructure in their buildings. So it can, and it's not free. So these things do cost. And so it can impact you know, having the enabling communications and, and kind of smart technologies you know, do impact the cost of providing these services, which can you know, impact cost effectiveness. Um, so in some cases, uh, it's necessary to kind of stack a bunch of value streams together um, to really realize the, all the different benefits of GEV and to have that benefit cost ratio be such that it can move forward and provide benefits. And sometimes it's really in the extreme events uh, where you actually realize the, the benefits of GEV. And so that can be tricky when um, ascertaining the cost benefit of, of GEVs. Um, so yeah, just wanted to put that out there. Um, but in terms of the key takeaway of some of the basics is that you know, there's a lot of potential benefits of GEBS, but enabling technologies and interop interoperability are required. So I didn't mention that, but between all those layers, you need to have interoperability. Things need to be able to talk to one another, especially if you're using different vendors. So that uh, enabling technologies and interoperability are required and can impact cost effectiveness. So these are the kinds of things that can be tested in a pilot. All right, so let's go ahead full one. So we've got skewed with GEV technologies. Non-existent, I have no familiarity other than with very basic uh, or, or very little is I you know, only have uh, uh, familiarity with energy efficiency and demand response, or maybe have some familiarity with grid interactive technologies, moderate or high. We don't have to worry too much about the detail. But look, uh, in terms of non-existent, very little, some moderate or high. Let me just give you a few moments here to vote, and indicate your where you're at.
got a pretty good response rate right now. We're at 18 of 24. So give it uh, about two more seconds. Going Sounds once, good. going twice, and the poll is closing. And I'll yeah. show you the results. Okay. Interesting. Okay. So mostly, most people are, are some, a majority, seven, some non existent, some very little, and a few feeling um, they have moderate or high familiarity. Okay. Excellent. All right. Well, I'll close that and then turn it back to Christine. Great. I was going to add it looks like a normal curve with the two tails. <laughs> okay. Great, so um, continuing on with GED basics, we provide a detailed example of a GED community in Basalt Vista, Colorado. This is a wonderful example because it covers so many potential needs. Firstly, it was designed, designed to be affordable housing developed through a partnership between Holy Cross Energy, the, the local co-op, and NREAL who provided the very complex software system called Network Optimized Distributed Energy Systems that allowed the homes to speak with the grid. The impetus for the pilot was Holy Cross's energy target of wanting to be 70% carbon free by 2030. The project featured 27 all electric new townhomes and they included features such as high efficiency appliances and high, highly efficient envelope cold climate heat pump water heaters, connected thermostats, rooftop photovoltaics, battery storage, and EV chargers. The systems were automated, so very little effort was needed on part of the homeowners. One of the primary goals of this SCED community was to reduce solar variability on distri distribution grid voltage by at least 20%. Secondly, uh, they wanted to use GEP to support critical load for up to five days with DERs throughout the community. So in other words, they wanted to use it for resilience. Uh, they were able to use Basalt Vista as a microgrid. Um, also, they wanted homes to be 35% better than code and reduce. they wanted to reduce peak demand by at least 10%. Lastly, the group of homes have the capability to act as a virtual power plant to increase its potential as a grid resource. Oh, and if you click on the link there, that'll give you more information about what NREAL is providing for the salt Vista. Thanks. Okay, wonderful. So we talked about the variety of GEB technologies and resources. Now in this section, we discussed the resulting benefits uh, one of the benefits is efficiency, and this is the permanent load reduction through the initial purchase of efficient equipment, appliances, and infrastructure, such as the building envelope, envelope and insulation. Also, through smart technologies, we can manage loads. Uh, we can shift load by dimming lights. We can um, shed load, sorry, we can shed load by dimming lights during peak periods. We can shift loads. So again, if we want to avoid that peak time, you can preheat the water, water tank, or you can pre-cool a, a room during those off-peak periods. So you need less energy during the peak. Um, next, you can also modulate loads. So you can modulate it at a more granular, granular, granular level and a higher frequency so that you can um, provide more resilience for the grid. You can also use GEB to generate electricity through rooftop solar and micro wind turbines. Some of the resulting benefits are then overall redu reduced energy usage, reduced emissions, reduced energy bills, peak demand reduction, uh, and that could potentially result in capital deferrals of either new supply side resources or reduced transmission and distribution needs. And lastly, GEB's flexible demand and supply provide more grid reliability. So they provide load smoothing, uh, renewable energy integration, 
ancillary services and resilience. Also, the National Roadmap estimates GEB having the potential to save up to hundreds of terawatt hours annually and provide billions of dollars of peak demand savings. So the, the takeaway here is that, you know, and, and this is sort of a common theme is that there are many GEB applications, but the technologies are complex as, you, as you've seen, and in large part because they have to respond to necessary grid signals. So you have to have adequate technologies and software to uh, integrate and accommodate GEB. Therefore, a pilot could help bring clarity to these complexities and support utilities in assessing benefits to the local grid system, as well as support building owners with performance and cost analysis. So next we speak to uh, key drivers and these are essentially energy needs of a particular service territory, which will help inform the GEB components that they want to include or test through the pilot. What problems are, are an issue that GEB could potentially solve or mitigate? These key drivers typically are backed by a policy mandate or longer term energy strategy. In Washington's case, they directed us to look at Washington's Clean Energy Fund, the Washington State Energy Strategy, legislative mandates, and particular state dockets. And some of the key drivers were found to be reliability, clean energy standard, which the state has mandated at 100% clean electricity by 2045, uh, greenhouse gas targets. And by 2050, they need to be, I believe, 90% lower than the 1990 levels of greenhouse emissions. They also look for resource adequacy, lowest reasonable cost, all cost effective energy efficiency and demand response. Uh, the state energy, energy strategy also calls for the electrification of transportation, electrifying and decarbonizing buildings. They call for resilience for customers, which is a really important aspect given extreme weather events uh, in light of climate change. Um, they also call for the recognition of equity in energy resources. And lastly, they speak a lot to workforce deployment and GEV has the potential to uh, assist in GDP or local employment through the local workforce. So now we're on to poll question number two. So for what are the top two GEB applications that you see for your state or your territory? So please pick two of these. Peak demand and capacity reduction, energy cost savings, reduced greenhouse gas emissions, flexibility for renewables integration, reliability, or resilience. We've got some answers trickling in. Let's give it another, say, five or so seconds um, while people think it over. And three, two, one. Uh, we'll end it now. Share the results. Oh, great. So looks like. Peak demand reduction was the top 60%. And then, let's see here. Oh, resilience was very high, 40%. Reliability, 33%. And cost savings, 33%. Wow. 
or the top. Great, thank you. Okay, so from the, t from the key drivers, our takeaway was that Washington utilities and policymakers could design pilots to test aspects of GEBS that will help them achieve their state policy goals and understand costs and benefits of GEV development and usage. So next, the next section in our technical brief spoke to metrics and data. And metrics are very, a very important pilot feature because they provide the measurement related to your desired goal or outcome. And the types of metrics to be included should speak to those key drivers for energy goals of utilities state, as we mentioned in the prior, prior slide. And then the type of data collected is what is used to assess the metrics. And we provide some examples of grid metrics, such as overall energy savings, how much capacity can GEB provide, how much renewable energy and behind the meter generation can be provided by GEB technologies. How can one best align load and supply flexibility with carbon reduction goals? Or more basically, what is GEB's ability to provide short-term and long-term load or supply flex flexibility? And what is the corresponding avoided cost for that utility when they use these different technologies? So this requires knowing baseline conditions as well as with the GEB technology conditions. So if we move on to the next slide, we just provide a couple of tables that we pulled from the uh, technical brief where we compiled a lot of these metrics. These metrics came from a variety of resources, the Department of Energy, LBNL, NREAL, New Buildings Institute had, uh, we incorporated their grid optimal metrics. So you can see we tied the potential metrics with the utility or state goal and what data units were needed for um, to measure the metrics. And we have another table here. This just provides more examples of goals, metrics, and data units. Um, if you're interested, when, we'll have the complete list in the technical brief that you can refer to. And continuing, in addition to grid metrics, we also had customer participation customer participation metrics. And this includes measuring customer retention as a result of uh, various technology activities, customer satisfaction, building performance metrics relative to comfort and productivity. Occupant, occupants need a productive workspace. So they can't work if the lighting's too dim or the air is too cold or too hot. So that's why you know, it's important to not only measure the grid impact of it, but also the building and occupant side of it as well. So metrics could also include measuring utility bill impacts, as well as first cost and operational costs of GEB technologies. What is the return on a particular building owner's investment in these GEB technologies? So a pilot could measure cost effectiveness, as well as study the impact of various customer messaging. And then on the next slide, here is just another table that we pulled from the brief that gives an example of some of the metrics pertaining to customer participation. And these are much more qualitative in nature than the grid metrics. And so that we also provided analysis measure that speaks to these qualitative measurements. The takeaway from metrics and data is that pilot components options are numerous. Unfortunately, pilot developers have um, you know, budget constraints, so they can't include everything. So they will need to choose which metrics to include and consider all the ways in which the data will be collected, analyzed, and evaluated for their particular service territory needs. So this brings us to poll question number three. What kind of participation do you have with GEB pilot creation? Are you uh, a creator of a pilot? 
Does your organization have the resources and the authority to actually create and execute a pilot? Are you a regulator? Um, does your organization approve pilots or does it guide other entities to conduct pilots? Three, are you an entity that provides feedback on pilot design and creation and execution? Four, is, is your organization a funding organization that provides funding for the pilot creation? Or five, are you a public building? So you, could your organization use more information about whether or not you want to participate or how you would participate in a GEB pilot? Right, right, we've got about 76% responded. I'm gonna give about five more seconds. So five, four, three, two, one, and we'll shut it down. So we should be able to see the results. Oh yeah, we see um, the majority of folks are going to give feedback on creation. So they're, they're a supporting institute. Um, next highest is funding. Oh, sorry. Next highest then is uh, public building. So your organization could uh, help inform or implement pilot, pilots from a public building's perspective. And then the third highest is uh, uh, folks that provide funding and support for public. Oh, very interesting. Thank you. Okay, now I'm going to turn it over to Juliet. Okay, so I just want to jump back in and talk about a few of the considerations for successful pilots. Um, I've got a lot here, and I'm not going to go into these, but these are things that you could read about in the um, checklist briefs when they're available. Um, equity is an important consideration, as we have mentioned, and how to consider disadvantaged communities and that they can participate and benefit uh, from pilots. But one thing I do want to touch on here is uh, utility alignment and preparedness. You know, one of the things that's really interesting and um, promising about GEBS is that it does span a number of different departments within a utility. So if a utility is to run a GEB pilot, it's, you know, it's kind of got your efficiency group, your demand response group, your resource planning group, your, your customer um, coordination folks at the, at the utility. And so if you're, you know, if some of the folks on this webinar are involved in reviewing pilots or helping to shape the pilots, you know, making sure that the alignment across the utility um, in the different departments, I think is important for a pilot success. Mm -hmm. Um, and then another thing I'll touch on here is this reviewing and vetting of pilot design. You know, when I worked for the Oregon Public Utility Commission, I was, uh, there was a utility that ran like a three-year demand response pilot, and then we had an evaluation done after the fact. And one, of, one thing the evaluator said was that they felt like the, the pilot design was a little bit flawed from the get-go. And so the, the pilot itself didn't show a lot of promise for, this, for demand response in this, this certain type in this certain area. But the evaluator was saying that they thought that, like I said, that the design wasn't could have been improved upon and they would have had better results. And that always stayed with me. And, and you know, as I think about pilots, they can either be really helpful. In some cases, they can um, take a lot of time and, and not have a really great um, results. So I think one of the things that can help is to have evaluators or third parties, if possible, review pilot design before implementation. And that way, you're not three years out or four years in and realize like, oh, we, you know, it could have been done better. We, we could have um, better got at the, the research questions that we had in mind. That's something I just want folks to really consider um, because the, I think the utility alignment and the reviewing embedding pilot design are important as are these other items, but I just wanted to, to touch on that briefly. All right, so Christine, you wanna talk about Hawaii? Yeah, great, thanks, Juliet. Yeah, so, um, after Washington, we started working on technical brief for Hawaii. And what we realized is that every state has a different starting point of, uh, and they also have different energy needs. And yeah, they just have different levels of 
participation in some of the existing um, gap components such as demand response or smart technologies. And so understanding that starting point is very, very important. Um, also, you know, one of the differences with Hawaii is that more than just utilities could potentially create these pilots. Hawaii Energy uh, is a administrator of their public benefits fee. It's for those of you who live in the North Pacific Northwest, it's similar to the Energy Trust of Oregon. So Hawaii, Hawaii Energy is a, a third party who administers demand response and energy efficiency programs. So they too potentially administer a GEB pilot. Also HNEI stands for Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. They're affiliated with the University of Hawaii. They also have the potential to create and administer a pilot. Additionally, you know, their key drivers are for the potential of GEB pilots it is a little bit different from Washington. Um, they wanted to emphasize grid planning and grid modernization dockets, distributed energy resource dockets. Um, they're, you know, they also are driven by energy efficiency and renewable portfolio standards. They're very concerned with transportation electrification, equity, and they also have strong microgrid concerns as well. So they would like to see GEB used for resilience as well. So there's some similarities with Washington, but uh, there's also some differences as well. And that's gonna be true of every state that we examine. Thank you. So I believe um, Juliet's gonna take the few remaining slides now. Oh, so I think Juliet just got knocked off. So I could take I can take the remaining slides as well until she gets back on. Um, so I will just share my screen. That's okay, Rodney. Yes, yeah, certainly. Okay. Yeah, you should be able to, to share it, Christine. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay, can everybody see that now? Yeah, it's it's come up, yes. Okay, thanks. Okay, I'm back. I had internet issues. Oh, okay. Um, so I, I could drive the last remaining slides. I already have it up. Juliet, if you'd like that. Go for it. Okay. Go for it, yeah. Great, so we are now on. Uh, next steps. Okay, so we're um, we're finalizing the briefs for Washington and Hawaii. We're going to share them with you, and we'll continue to work with other states if time and budget allows. Um, next slide. We'll get to those questions. I just want to thanks uh, thank Monica Newcomb and um, U.S. Department of Energy Buildings Technology Office, Natalie Frick from Berkeley Labs has done a great job leading this project, and thanks to Rodney and Danielle from Nazio and Nehruk, and then to all the participants in Washington and Hawaii, um, we thank you. And last slide. So if you all have any questions that you, you don't get to here, please feel free to reach out to us. Thank you. Great, Julia and Christine, thank you so much for that presentation, that was awesome. Um, I'm just gonna kick it off with one question and then I do see we have um, a question from Jeff as well, but let's start with this. If you were gonna recommend a starting place for states that are interested in GEBS and want to maybe pursue a GEB pilot, where would you suggest that they start? Christine, do you wanna take this to start? Yes. Um, so if you want to, you know, if a utility wants to initiate uh, a GEB pilot, I think a good place to start is understanding, you know, what are the most important needs? And that takes a strong understanding of avoided costs and knowing where the cost savings can come in. Um, I think another good place to start is looking at the existing pilots. You know, locally, there's been 
uh, you know, Keenan and Alice conducted their transactive energy study on the Richland campus. Uh, PGE, uh, they're engaging in a huge demand response program right now in Oregon. And that's where we found a lot of good, good information on customer messaging and um, awareness, customer awareness and retention levels. So you can look inward for your needs, but you can also look outwards to the studies that have been done, as well as uh, look to other pilots and understand what technologies already exist so that you're not recreating the wheel. Yeah, and I would just, I'd just add to that, you know, I would suggest talking with the utilities in your state and other energy stakeholders, understand the existing demand response, response pilots and build on those. Um, continuing education, I think, is important on DEBS. Um, and then really looking at those rare events that may not happen a lot, but they could really benefit a lot from flexible demand and try and quantify and characterize the value of, of DEBS in those rare events, because I think that's a lot of where DEB will pay for itself really quickly on those those rare but really important uh, kind of extreme events that seem to be uh, more frequent these days. That's great. Thank you, uh, both of you. I want to get in uh, Jeff's question here. So uh, when the same software is being deployed over multiple hardware environments, including with GEBS, microgrids, fleet optimized, EV, uh, charging to name a few, should pilots be agnostic and avoid those technology deployment silos, but focused on outcomes that benefit all rate payers, like taking capacity, providing capacity, or ancillary services? Big question. Any thoughts on, on this question from either of you? That's kind of a million dollar question. What do you want your pilot to study? You know, I'm, I'm, I think it's kind of a two edged sword where, yes, you want to solve grid needs, but you have to make it um, advantageous or attractive to the building owner as well. I mean, they should get something out of it as well. But, you know, it's ultimately up to the pilot creator. Yeah, yeah and I think these are some of the big million dollar questions that the regulators get to get to deal with is, you know, some if the utility does have a software that they're comfortable and they're already using, then I can see it making sense to use that software in the GEV pilot. Um, but at the same time, you know, the open source tech um, software that can be compatible with a lot of different types of equipment, you know, that's, to me, that's a, um, this more fungible, it's kind of more applicable, uh, but at the same time, yeah, so I, it's on the one hand, on the other hand, um, I can see pros, um, pros and cons of both approaches on that one, actually. I think either could work. Yeah, fantastic. I. I think we answered um, Jake's question, but I don't know, Liz or other folks um, that are familiar with the work in Washington, did you all want to comment any on anything else regarding the, the building performance standards? Maybe I'll chime in. This is Rodney. Um, I did put in the chat box a uh, link to a report that uh, we put out under the umbrella of the working group, uh, NASIO report on incorporating demand flexibility aspects into uh, policies and programs that are traditionally oriented towards energy efficiency, uh, like benchmarking and, and uh, disclosure and, and building ratings, as well as building performance standards. We also talk a bit about codes and appliance standards and even zoning a bit. And a lot of that touches on, as Juliet and, and, and Christine had noted, some of the metrics, particularly the use of grid optimal metrics. So we do have some suggestions there as to how one may incorporate that into building performance standards, but there is a bit of you need to learn to crawl before you learn to walk. And there's a lot of work uh, required for building performance standards, even using uh, uh, energy use intensity, the conventional uh, usage. I would note that New York City's uh, building performance standard uses a carbon metric. And by default, there's sort of the fixed uh, value of a kilowatt hour equals X amount of CO2, but the provision does allow for a building owner to request a calculation based on time of use. 
And the law also allows the buildings department to come up with, uh, with uh, different metrics in the out years. So that's a little bit of a hook that allows time differentiation to be incorporated and uh, demand flexibility. So that, that's a bit long-winded, but I guess the uh, thing is building performance standards are pretty new, um, but there is large opportunity for uh, demand flexibility and time of use to be incorporated. And, uh, and Jake did put an item in that uh, IMT has a document uh, addressing this as well. Great. Well, I know we're at time. Does um, anyone have any closing comments? I, I think I have a bunch more questions, but I'll, I'll send them to you afterwards. <laughs> Um, we're available. Love to love to hear from folks. You know, if you have suggestions for ways we can improve what we presented, love to hear that. So yeah, just thank you so much for the opportunity. It's been really good. Thank you. Well, we're glad to have you. Thanks to all of you. Uh, we will be posting these on the uh, Geb Working Group uh, resources page uh, as soon as we can process them. That that may not be until uh, the beginning of next week or at least a couple of days. Uh, thank you, Juliet and, and Christine. Uh, Liz had to skedaddle, so thanks to her. Uh, thank you, Grace, as well. And of course, we're always grateful for our partnership with Danielle and her colleagues at NARUC. And uh, many thanks to Ed, who's the magician behind the scenes there uh, uh, for, uh, for making this happen. So <laughs> thank you all and take care. And uh, remember, there is a, a, a relevant uh, webinar on Thursday that NARUC is putting on on virtual power plants. Uh, recommend that. Thank you all. Take care. Thank you, Rodney. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.